get a new camera. Huh. Victory dance. Did I get your attention yet? Good! Mirror's Edge. The game begins where the main protagonist, Faith, explains how the city she lives in has changed over time from a dangerous yet lively home. A home of freedom. But gradually that would come to pass as the government that was in power began to dictate the lives of the people, albeit very subtle initially. Changes to everyday life was acceptable by some, but others didn't feel the same. What began as a simple protest led to riots when police officers opened fire on unarmed civilians 18 years prior to where the game takes place. Citizens that didn't choose to conform to the new changing way of life were considered criminals and arrested. These people would become the clients of runners, people that would free run amongst the city roofs to deliver information from one another, although it's never really specified on what any of the information actually is. The main focus of the game's story is to prove Faith's sister's innocence after being framed for killing a man, Robert Pope, who also had been friends with their father. Faith's sister, Kate, who was also a police officer, had been keeping in touch with Robert Pope after a recent break-in he had beforehand. While visiting with him in his building, she was caught off guard and knocked unconscious, and once she awoke, she saw Pope lying dead on his desk from a gunshot wound to the head done with her own gun. Faith shows up shortly after hearing the police dispatch calling in officers to a shots fired call to Pope's building via the comm systems that they use to intercept police radio feed. Faith tells Kate to leave with her as it's obvious she's being framed. However, Kate refuses saying that it will only make her look more guilty. I'm not like you. Money will just make me look guilty. You think this was an accident? So Faith, upon hearing this, says that she'll do what she can to find out who is framing her and thus begins our game. The gameplay is entirely in a first-person perspective, and the main hook of this game is to free run and parkour, which is a very interesting combination. But despite it sounding like a disaster, it actually works out pretty good. There are some quirks and issues here and there all the same, though. So you start off in this big, pretty city with a very simple color scheme that was implemented intentionally for players to distinguish between parts of the environment that can and cannot be interacted with. So most of this game's architecture is made up of white, but then you also have your oranges, your yellows, some greens and blues here and there, but the color you want to look for amongst all else is red. Anything in the environment that's red or transitions into red is something that you can use to free run on and typically is intended to be exploited as soon as it's seen due to the game's linear level design. A game like this can really benefit from an open world design, and after playing it, it's relatively easy to tell that this city was made from scratch as a whole, and each level is basically a predetermined path, possibly to simplify an attempt to better streamline the free run. That being said, however, it's not particularly an issue, and I think the developers made the right choice on focusing on the style of level design. So, again as I mentioned before, the free running is the main hook of the game, and with that comes a number of different parkouring techniques. You run and jump, and yes, that is a given, but you can also run on walls, run up walls, and jump from both variations. You can also slide, grab most ledges and jump from one ledge to another while hanging, and pull vault from a handful of different things in order to get to a higher place. Also, when falling from a great height, Faith can tumble forward to channel her momentum better in order to keep her speed, but also to keep her from landing flat on the ground and dealing with all the fall damage that would come otherwise. Although it may seem limited, there's a lot of depth to be had, and you will have to progressively get better with Faith's skills as you progress further in the game. The combat in the game is relatively simple. You can do a one-two punch, which is pretty much the standard, but you can also slide towards an enemy and follow up with a low kick during the slide to help keep the flow of your speed. The game's mechanics are mostly geared towards running from the enemies instead of actually fighting them. Get that one out of there. However, there are parts of the game that force you into situations that require you to fight the officers and SWAT members. Watch it, moves up ahead. Looks like you're gonna have to fight. You can also counter the enemies, which will disarm them and automatically encape them in just a few seconds, and this is useful for trying to take out enemies quickly and pick up a weapon to contend with any other enemies all the quicker if need be. 
Of course, for any female protagonist of a game, there's been no move greater than... The Junk Punch! Junk Punch! Girl power. So like I just mentioned, there are weapons that can be recovered from enemies that can be used for an offensive. Now, I'm not going to waste any time in saying that I really don't like the gun controls. This game came out in 2008, about a year after the 7th generation of consoles released, so FPS shooting controls weren't really established at this point and didn't have a mainstream formula, so to speak, a la Call of Duty. You can only shoot from the hip and can't aim down the sights, which I understood why that was, but still didn't get used to it right away. Anybody who has yet to play this game will feel very awkward at not being able to aim down the sights. That aside, another thing that isn't as excusable, however, is that there's no ammo count in. The developers probably wanted to have a clean view of Faith's perspective to keep the game more immersive, but I don't think an ammo counter would have felt very intrusive if they put one in. I mean, come on. Unlike Call of Duty heads up displays, an ammo counter was nothing new by this point. But. Guns are very seldom used in the game, so it's not an ongoing issue that I'm going to dwell on. Mirror's Edge is a game where you're guaranteed to die a lot. The levels are mostly of skyscraper rooftops that you make your way across to get to your objective. The free running takes practice to get the hang of, and that being said, you're going to screw up and fall to your death, like a thousand times. Everything is a variable. Faith's momentum, speed, timing. It takes practice, and believe me when I say that it will get frustrating. There's no lives or game overs in Mirror's Edge, but surprisingly, it's still upsetting when you die. This is mostly prominent when dying in the same spot over and over, which gets frustrating and causes you to be impatient, thus resulting in sloppy free running. You get a good sense of height in this game. I've never had an issue with heights, but even I get that fragile tingling in my hands and toes for fear of falling. I can even understand someone getting vertigo from the heights. You know those dreams that you have sometimes when you're real high up on something? It's like everything before that was in the dream is real cloudy and hard to remember right up until you jump and it becomes very lucid in that moment and you can feel the fear in your chest when you're falling and wake up only as you hit the ground. I mean, I've, I've had those. I've had those. You've had those. I've had those. Falling dreams. Nightmares. I really do like the environments in their own particular way. What I mean by this is, as a runner, Faith is against conforming to how the government has established the lifestyles of the citizens. And I believe a small nod to this is how through Faith's eyes you can always see the people below you walking about, as well as cars driving around in the city. However, Faith never is in an area that corresponds with another area that the civilians are in. It gives me a sense of loneliness that enhances this personal journey that Faith undergoes all the more. Now look. This game isn't all precision and perfection like I've inclined to up to this point. This game does have a good chunk of problems that I also need to bring up as well. The game can do without the guns, honestly. It's purely discretionary to pick up a gun, but at later points of the game on a first run, it's almost impossible to get through some of the SWAT teams without using a gun unless you want to spend like 10 freaking years just because you want the achievement. And then once you take out an enemy, it might as well be an alarm because everyone just automatically knows where you are, whether you used a gun or not. Most of the time you can just run away and avoid the cops, and most of the time it's the suggested thing to do. But the game turns around and contradicts itself by putting you in situations where you're forced to take out all of the enemies in that area. And in cases like these, the unintuitive control scheme becomes very, very apparent. Let me ask you something. What button do you think you use to jump with on the PS3 controller? X, right? No. Go ahead, try again. I'll wait. Maybe circle, right? Yeah, maybe, right? Mm. 
You give up? It's L1. What the hell is that? How weird is that? And then you punch with R2. It, it just feels weird. The face buttons are hardly ever used except for just a couple of things like uh, triangle to disarm your enemies or square to use an elevator or open a door or something like that. Circle is pretty handy as it's used to have faith face in the direction of where it is you need to go in case you get turned around and lose your sense of direction and it can happen from time to time. This function could have been mapped to a different button though in the interest of having a better control scheme. I know what some of you were thinking. But Derek, why can't you just change the controls and the settings to something better? Let me be clear. There is an option to change the controls, however there are only presets in the control options and you can't change the individual buttons. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those types of f***ing games. I'm sorry, but one thing I get real picky with are my controls. And you know what? I don't ask for much when it comes to how I play the game. But when half the reasons I die are because I still can't get used to the controls after playing for a few days, I start getting a little bitter. Look, after giving it some thought, I know you were expected to move Faith and control her view while jumping at the same time, and that would essentially mean that you would need three thumbs if you want to use the X button to jump, or whatever face button. But even at that, they could have at least let me use the same hand to jump in a game where every other game has always used my right hand to do so. Another thing is, I think this game would have been much better with stealth sequences as opposed to combat scenarios. If you could use those parkour skills to stealth your way around enemies in this game, I think it could have been much better. I mean, the game is basically structured with that in mind, considering the majority of the game will have you avoid enemies and fight them. And Faith can only take minimal hits anyways, she's not really built for combat. I don't think she can take more than two hits before she goes down. Towards the end of the game, you have to contend with enemy freerunners that pursue you and really put your freerunning skills to the test. However, in hindsight, it feels kind of like a missed opportunity, seeing as how with the right elements in place, could have made for some very engaging gameplay. And as far as difficulty, there's sort of a step backwards. They group up and chase you while shooting you with taser guns, clicking you basically. But when the main enemies were the cops, it was harder because all they had to do was shoot you. But these enemies are plot specific, so that's more than likely why they show up towards the end of the game. They're part of the Project Icarus, a project that was put in place by the government to intercept and inevitably get rid of the runners. You know, there's kind of a lot of plot points that haven't been made. I mean, if the government wants to get rid of the runners, then why do they gotta make their own runners to get rid of runners like Faith? And that's another thing too, there isn't a lot of other runners that are made mention of. Except for Merc, who communicates with you throughout the game, Celeste, who is your tutorial level, and Jackknife, who isn't even a runner anymore. The only other person that I know is a runner is the black guy at the end of the level who asks Faith if she's okay when she falls through a glass ceiling, whom I will call Black Guy Runner. And also, why is it the government that's the bad guy in this game? I mean, you know, why is it always the government? I mean, I, I can understand they're easy to make the antagonist of a game, you know, because they're a government, face their organization, but the people that are running the city in this game, I mean, I don't really see a problem. It's not like they're weaponizing cancer or anything from what you can tell. They're just doing what a government does. They have a lot of surveillance or whatever, but I mean, they're not necessarily a dictatorship. I'm not seeing people not allowed to drive their cars or walk freely among the streets. You don't have a bunch of platoons of soldiers wanting to start marching up and down the roads and shoot the first civilian that they see burping in public. I mean, think about it. I've given it some thought. I mean, what if the runners are the bad guys? I mean, the objective of a runner is to run from one location to the other and transport these bags that you collect throughout each level that is never made any kind of mention of what's in it. You know, it could be a bomb. I mean, what is it actually? What if the runners are the bad guys? I mean, think about it. But you know what? More than anything else, I don't even know why this game is called Mirror's Edge. We exist on the edge between the gloss and the reality. The Mirror's Edge. Oh yeah, that's why it's called Mirror's Edge. Makes sense now. 
So in an attempt to clear Kate's name, Faith investigates Pope's murder by attempting to get information from a couple of people. One guy named Jackknife, who is a former runner, implies that Pope's bodyguard Burfield, who used to be a wrestler that went by the stage name Ropeburn, is just a thug that got lucky. Uh, he's really just a thug who got lucky. And had something, something to do with his murder. Faith eavesdrops on a conversation that Ropeburn has on the phone from an air vent confirming that he wanted a cop to go down for the murder. Faith meets with Kate's superior, Lieutenant Miller, on several occasions to see if he can help with any information on clearing Kate's name. So with more cutscenes that really don't lead anywhere, Faith pursues Ropeburn on her own. Faith encounters Ropeburn, and he'll have to QTM off the side of the building where he's found to get her to start talking. He confesses that he hired someone to assassinate Pope, and that he's going to be meeting with him again the following day. Faith asks why Ropeburn was meeting with Lieutenant Miller moments earlier and agrees to pull him up in exchange for answers. However, he gets shot by someone from another building, obviously in an attempt to prevent any information from being leaked. Someone shoot They got Ropeburn. What the? With Faith knowing that Ropeburn was going to meet with the hired gun again at the mall, she decides to go instead. Once arriving, you find that the person waiting there for him was the same person who shot him the day before. As you pursue, multiple blues show up to intervene and cut off your pursuit of the assassin. So blah blah blah, more running and shooting, blah blah blah, more progressive those cutscenes, blah blah blah, security camera of what you already know, and then you catch up with the assassin once more. You guys exchange a couple of punches and then you give chase again. It's weird how I get a sense of deja vu when trying to match the assassin's parkouring point for point. It reminds me of chasing Shadow Mario in Super Mario Sunshine, because you can't help but want to chase him the exact same way. Anyhow, you catch up and fight some more, and then cutscene. Assassin tries to get away, Faith catches the assassin, the identity of the assassin is revealed, but no. Could it be? It couldn't! <laughs> oh, I'm not good at that. I honestly saw it a mile away. I mean, it's not like there's a lot of other characters in the game to narrow it down. You guys probably figured it out without even playing the game. Anyways. Celeste comes clean, saying her motivation for her actions were that the runners were, for a lack of a better word, screwed. The runners are screwed. You see? There you go. And that Pope's campaign was getting more help than expected and he eventually found out about Project Icarus. He had made plans to put a stop to Project Icarus, which was put in place by the higher-ups, in which they had enlisted Celeste to assassinate him and set up Faith's sister to take the fall. Celeste suggests that she wanted to live as opposed to survive, blah blah blah, and really at this point I kinda lost interest in the plot. It's too predictable. In any case, the main goal is the same, to save Kate. Kate has been tried and was found guilty. You have to make your way to a vantage point and snipe the engine of the vehicle in the convoy that's transporting Kate to the prison. Once that's done, you make your way down the building and you have to work your way through the guards to get to her. Faith reunites with her sister and gets her out of the van. The biggest question I have is why does she still have her police uniform on? Isn't she supposed to be dressed in something more along the lines of orange? Faith gives her headset to Kate and tells her that Merc will guide her on where to go. The very next scene is Faith coming upon Merc's hideout to see it trashed and Kate nowhere to be found. Merc is found underneath an overturned couch and was fatally wounded. Faith apologizes and Merc forgives her, saying to just not let them win. So you make your way through the last level, Lieutenant Miller shows up and helps, as it turns out he's a good guy, and that says something to me. Cause I can't trust a guy when his eyebrow color and hair color don't match. You make your way to the roof where there's a chopper preparing to leave and Jackknife is there, holding a handcuffed Kate by gunpoint. Why is she still in her uniform? Faith determines that the current mayor, Mayor Callahan, is behind this. Jackknife explains that all this is to keep the clients of the runners from being able to communicate in an unmonitored way and without Pope being mayor, the runners wouldn't exist any longer. The chopper takes off and Faith parkours her way onto the chopper and kicks Jackknife out while he's firing his automatic gun. 
even though before he had a normal pistol and could have just shot Faith right then and there during his little monologue. This causes the chopper to go down and Faith gets her and her sister out just in time, thus ending the game. Now I know that maybe I've made it seem like I don't like the game, but that's not the case at all. As far as I'm concerned, I think this game has done a lot of things right. It's virtually a pioneer for creating a free-running mechanic in video games, and it's such a shame that other games haven't adopted the formula since. At least not until Dying Light's recent release, and at the time of this video's recording, it's March 2015. That's seven years! Also, I really like the graphical style. It's not super polished, but that's a perspective from someone that has played it for the first time seven years after its release. They didn't try to do any hyper-realistic imagery, they did just enough to show what the now previous generation of consoles would be capable of. The color schemes are awesome and do well to be visually appealing as well as being functional. Also the fact that you can see your arms and legs as you look around, run, and so on is always something that impressed me throughout my duration of playing the game considering no other game does that, at least not until Dying Light. And that being said, the only thing I think that would make the game better is some zombies. Bottom line, Mirror's Edge is a good game. The story isn't the most compelling, and you can't walk two feet without being able to poke a hole in it, but that's not why I would recommend the game. Sure, it has its fair share of problems. The controls are kind of lousy and take a little bit of time to get used to. The first-person shooting mechanics aren't that great, and the combat doesn't really need to be there. There was a few glitches here and there, but nothing that really drastically affected my playthrough. Nothing that broke the game, anyways only just sent me back to the previous checkpoint. The game isn't super long, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. If you got responsibilities and can't play every single day, job, kids, whatever, but you still want to get a good game under your belt that has a decent focus on what it wants to be in the story, for the most part, the Mirror's Edge is a game I could definitely recommend. Now while playing this game and trying to get my facts straight, I actually did find out that currently right now there is another game in the series that's in development. The only thing I can say about that is I just hope that it, with this new installment in the series that they fix whatever issues that this game had and basically polish it up and clean it up. No more guns. Really. Don't need the gun. Keep going! Keep going! Seven! <laughs>